Hey, have you ever had the thought, I wonder what Dr. X would do in this situation? Now, you know who Dr. X is, right? Dr. X happens to be an expert or someone with a high level of uh, experience or expertise with certain conditions. I'm not talking about a James Bond villain, but then again, that was Dr. No, wasn't it? Yes, no. Anyway, I've certainly done that uh, on uh, many occasions. Whenever I'd come across a challenging case, there have been quite a few too, let me tell you, I'd often think, what would Dr. X do in this situation? Um, Dean, uh, good to see you on board here because uh, today's show, uh, I would probably have to put you as a proudly sponsored by Dean Newman over in Perth, Western Australia. Anyway, over my uh, 33 years as a clinician, I've got to say, I've met some outstanding health practitioners and they've been incredibly generous in sharing their skills and expertise with me. In fact, I still seek out practitioners who are passionate about what they do. Uh, you know, just last week uh, I was having a lunch with uh, uh, local physio genius uh, and the conversation uh, invariably uh, was based a lot about uh, treatments and what we do and I asked him, so what do you do with arthritic knees? And we chatted and discussed the pros and cons and what the research was saying. And I had the thought, I wonder what Simon Bartholdt, sports medicine expert, what did he think about uh, these anti-gravity treadmills? Because part of our conversation uh, with uh, Ben, the physio, uh, was about um, what can anti-gravity, could they be helpful in treating uh, pelvic fractures? So, you know, our discussion went, uh, took a few paths. But I was thinking, okay, who's the expert? Who's my Dr. X in this situation that could provide some um, useful information? I mean, anti-gravity treadmills, it's high-tech stuff, it's in the football clubs. Now, are they really helpful or is it just techno hype? So I reached out to Barthold for his opinion and he very generously responded to very quickly. And that's exactly what Dean Newman, our special uh, catalyst for today's show. Uh, he's a physio over in the wild west of Australia in Perth. It's exactly what Dean did too. Uh, Dean reached out to me and asked what would I do in this uh, interesting first MP joint case that had recently hobbled into his clinic. Um, her first MP joint uh, had been fused so now what can we do? Uh, Dean's message was uh, very timely too because given our current theme of first MP joint conditions here on the, the Triple T show, uh, as you know we've been uh, chewing the fat about bunions for a couple of episodes now. Jeez, oh, I hope that's not a bit of gristle. Uh, anyway, uh, so Dean has given me his uh, permission to share his case with you. Uh, now, while the patient uh, didn't present as a, uh, a classical or typical first MP joint case, she's not entirely unique either. Now, I'll give you the details in just a few minutes. But first, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Ted Jed, in red, a specialist in manual therapies for the lower limb, coming to you live from our beautiful home office of Ted Education here in sunny South Australia. Well, it's sunny on the other side of the rain clouds. Uh, it is officially spring, but <laughs> the weather's a little bit uh, struggling. Anyway, uh, as it so happens, we're counting down the days to our next uh, return trip to London and to Europe, where we'll, we're delivering our sold-out uh, FMT workshops. Um, it's going to be great fun to venture, venture back into the Northern Hemisphere again and meet so many dedicated health practitioners who are keen to learn how manual therapies can fix feet. Uh, we're going to be catching up with uh, past graduates, a lot of great friends that we've made over the years, uh, as well as meeting a whole lot of new faces. Can't wait! So, today's Triple T show continues with part three of our five-part series about treating bunions. Yes, you heard that right. Five parts! Uh, last week um, we told you that we were going to be doing four parts uh, on a four, this is a four part series on bunions, uh, but th th again, thanks to some awesome questions and requests, uh, we're delivering a gangbuster five part series about bunions, so you can have the full breadth of tips from Ted, oh glad you can't see that down below, uh, but we're wanting you to get all the full um, plethora of tips so that you can get even better clinical results. So, 
clean out your earwax. This is going to be another belly button popping show. Uh, we had a phenomenal response to last week's uh, Triple T show uh, where we chatted about bunions and treating them without actually touching the first MTP joint. Uh, we talked about uh, assessing and treating along the kinetic chain that was related to the first MP joint using uh, stainless steel tools like uh, this one here, uh, which is a, a, a myo bar, uh, and uh, it's a very useful tool if, if we're going to get into for assessing and detecting any fascial densities or irregularities in those uh, connective tissue structures. Uh, in fact, you could even use something like this, a spoon with you know, a stainless steel handle, you can run the tool and detect any irregularities. In fact, um, I did some home experimenting uh, after last week's show, and see the thickness of this uh, spoon here? Now, compare it to the thickness here. You'll see that it's actually, uh, the knife, uh, the butter knife is probably twice as thick. The weight and the extra th thickness of the tool here, I think, works uh, more effectively. Um, but uh, if you look, if you haven't caught up about uh, the Triple T show from last week, you can still find it on our Foot Mobilization Techniques Facebook page. Uh, also, special shout outs to um, physio. Uh, physical therapist Chris in the US. So uh, we've uh, struck up a great uh, friendship recently. Uh, and also Minu in uh, Canada. Good to hear you from you again. I hope you've downloaded those uh, exercise handouts. Um, Jono in Melbourne, uh, thanks for your message. Uh, John's actually been using his scalpel handle, uh, as I recommended in uh, last week's show, uh, and uh, he's getting some great feedback physically and also from his clients. Uh, Jono, I've got some very exciting news on the <clears throat> pardon me, tool assisted massage uh, training, so it'll be, it'll be coming to you soon. Uh, in fact, we've got a world first to announce in next week's show, so you won't want to miss that. Uh, also, Bunyan Buster himself, international best-selling author, Dan Fitzpatrick. G'day mate, hope you're enjoying your lunchtime salad today. Here's Dan's uh, incredible book, uh, what a, a great uh, collection of uh, bun great Bunyan success in treating and uh, removing Bunyans without surgery. In fact, uh, I saw one of uh, Dan's protégés this morning, Brent. Uh, he was presenting some uh, case studies on Bunyans on YouTube, uh, and wow, <laughs> so many Bunyans are being busted without surgery. Woohoo! Very pleased to see that. Um, okay, let me give you a, an outline of today's Triple T show, Ted's Tips on Tuesday. Uh, first, I'm going to be presenting the more typical first MP joint presentations that you would normally see in your clinics you know, quite commonly. Uh, I'll give you a published, uh, peer-reviewed case study uh, to highlight some of the key tips and tricks from Ted. Uh, second, I'm going to run through Dean's case, uh, the case I mentioned uh, earlier at the beginning of this show. I'm going to reveal the key factors of the clinical presentation, uh, Dean's concerns about the case, uh, the relevant medical history, the current key complaints that the client is experiencing, uh, the current treatment plan in place, uh, my suggestions for the case, and how to implement, seven fingers, yes, implement these suggestions just by raiding your kitchen drawer. Then we'll reveal the crucial element of managing a complex case like this and um, this will help you with your client management for those more straightforward cases as well as the tougher ones. Now, <laughs> before we get stuck in, a quick word from our sponsor because we have a crazy pet. <laughs> She's just run off with my pen. Phew. Uh, today's show is proudly brought to you by Crazy Cat Productions. Um, worried about Mad Cow? Hmm, don't. Get a crazy cat instead. It'll take your mind off being mad. Hey, for example, why do cows have hooves instead of feet? Because they lack toes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's bad. Oh, I tell you, I've got to milk that one for all it's worth. Okay, enough madness. So, what do you think, Penny? <laughs> She's going to town. Good. I better get stuff uh, organised now before she comes back and uh, tackles me up here. All right. Let's jump into today's Ted's Tips on Tuesdays, Triple T TV, on the topic of 
busting bunions when you can't touch the first MP joint because it's fused. Now, before we launch into Dean's case, let's start with a more typical case presentation. In fact, uh, tell me, Kirsten, now that you're here, you're going to be definitely able to contribute here. What's the usual way that patients with first MP joint problems, how do they come to you? Now, I know that they walk through your consulting room door, but I mean, how do they get referred to you or how do they find you? Please type in your answers below. And while you're doing that, I will wet my whistle and see what we've got. A few weeks ago, uh, I was chatting with um, one of my favourite physios in London, Jane Baker. She happened to be an animal physio uh, for quite a while too. I wonder if she's treated any crazy cats or crazy cows. Uh, anyway, oh, sorry, I digress. So Jane uh, does a lot of foot and ankle physiotherapy, probably is uh, now well established as a uh, physio for the foot and ankle. Jane's built uh, very strong relationships with her local orthopods, uh, and uh, she's done this over the years. Uh, now they regularly refer to Jane for post-surgical management, but uh, even for pre-surgery opinions as well. And maybe surgery, you know, often the surgeons are asking, is surgery actually necessary? Uh, Jane's been a um, regular student at our FMT courses in the UK, uh, and uh, she's been using that training to enhance her lower limb manual therapy skills. Uh, another great friend, uh, Mel South uh, from uh, Southampton in the UK. Got to introduce you to Scully here. This is uh, a tyre designed and provided by Mel. <laughs> it was great. Uh, of course, the, the back view is if you're doing FMT or manual therapies, do it with thrust. Of course, as you would. <laughs> Come, Mel. Um, uh, a lot of Mel's uh, consultants and surgeons will refer their patients to Melly for some Melly magic to see if they too can avoid any surgical interventions. Um, in fact, uh, Mel came to the very first uh, FMT courses we ran in the UK in 2010. Oh, I can't believe it's seven years. Anyway, all right, so uh, let me check here. Oh, great. So, uh, yes, Kirsten, uh, they are usually here for something else. Yes, uh, isn't that often the case? They might be presenting with some problem. However, uh, you've got the opportunity to help or advise or, or by the way, I've got this big toe problem. Can you help? Um, and, and Dean, yes, okay, so they've come for other low limb pathologies. All right, we've got a, a bit of a theme there. Uh, referred by uh, the GPs. Okay, yes, uh, surgeons think that I'm a nutter. Oh, no, sorry, surgeons think that Ted is a nutter. Oh, I agree. that's a whole other story. I think Lil must have uh, contributed that one. Um, I'm a podiatrist, so uh, I, they think I know about bunions. Oh, okay. Well, good, that would be a logical thing. I uh, had surgery, but didn't work. Ah, yeah. Uh, we certainly have had uh, a lot of cases come from a post-surgical treatment uh, as well. All right. Um, okay, so we've got a, a bit of a, uh, a general cross-section of sources. Good eye. Now, interestingly, uh, the first case study that I have for you today came to me because her mother had bunion surgery, and it was a disaster. So uh, Liz, uh, the patient, who was a fit, active, uh, youthful 53-year-old woman, uh, very uh, into tennis and bushwalking. Oh, for our American friends, bushwalking is uh, what you call walking in the woods. Um, the last time I talked about uh, bushwalking in uh, the American countries of uh, US and uh, Canada, they were referring, thinking I was talking about another part of the anatomy that might be called bush. So anyway, I just wanted to clarify that. It was walking in the woods. Um, all right, so then, uh, oh, yeah, so Liz didn't want to risk having surgery and end up like her mum with a disastrous result. So she was uh, seeing us for non-surgical treatment options. Now, I have here uh, just a print of a case study that uh, was peer-reviewed and published in uh, the UK uh, Podiatry Journal. Um, that, uh, the, I suppose, some of the, the, if I go through the background uh, with Liz, give you some uh, relevance uh, context here. Uh, there was uh, some, uh, 
She had gradual uh, onset of first MP joint pain over a period of three years, but it was the most uh, the last six months that was getting particularly uh, troublesome for her. Uh, there was no uh, relevant history of uh, trauma or uh, medical events. The pain site specifically was on the medial plantar aspect, and it was reproduced with compression on the medial sesamoid. So. Um, that was part of my suspicion of some sesamoiditis as well as first MP joint uh, issues going on here. Uh, Weight-bearing x-rays showed uh, that uh, HAV uh, displacement, we had uh, using uh, the uh, Ruto Ryan Weed scale of phase one, two, three, four, she was around between phase two and phase three. There was limited first MP joint dorsiflexion and adduction, that was limited as well. Quality within the joint, there was moderate crepitus within the first uh, uh, MP joint itself. The concertina tests, then when you press down to see how much uh, adduction of the first metatarsal would take place, um, that was also negative. So Liz's key concern was how do we treat this problem of the hallux distortion without going under the knife and me still being able to do the things that I love to do. I'm too young to pull up stumps is pretty much what she was telling me. So we recommended a treatment plan that had three key objectives, which were one, testing, testing, is to improve the quality of motion and range of motion of the affected tissues in her feet, in the ankles and in the legs. The second part was, probably add some sunshine into our life and if we look at this yeah that's the way to fly nice landing uh, so part two was uh, to stretch out the contracted connective tissues um, connective tissues always adapt to the shortest functional length and if there's mechanical distortions or displacements those tissues would have contracted we needed to release those so that we could actually get some restoration of normal joint function and ability the third phase of uh, our treatment plan was going to be strengthening weakened muscles, muscles that had adapted or taken on new patterns of working or not working. The treatment interventions that we used were joint mobilization, specifically to get some mobilization therapies into those restricted joints. Uh, we looked at fascial release techniques so that we could get into those restrictions and uh, again restore normal joint function. We looked at uh, introducing isometric muscle strengthening exercises and gait retraining, literally getting her brain to talk to the muscles and restore a more effective gait method. The great news is, is that over a period of six months, the HAV angle, the displacement, uh, went from 28 degrees and reduced down to 16 degrees. Now, ideally it should be less than 15 or 12 degrees. Um, if I just uh, pull out that section here, I'm not sure how well you're going to see this, <laughs> but Penny, you're definitely gonna see this more effectively. Um, okay, flying frisbee number two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, here we go, there we go. Fly, little Frida, fly, Willie, fly. <laughs> So here are the uh, uh, x-ray results. Uh, so um, I'm not sure if that's gonna stay focused, uh, but what you'll see is in the pre and post went from 28 degrees to uh, 16 uh, degrees. So much better uh, and all without uh, any surgery that took place there. Now, uh, we also did uh, pre and post treatment um, uh, quality of life uh, scores using the foot health status questionnaire. Now, her, um, uh, there were two categories of the questionnaire that we used, her foot pain levels and also foot function. The readings went from uh, 50 and 72, so it's foot pain and foot function, 50 and 72 to 84 and 100 respectively. So 100 is the top score, that's, um, that's what we're aiming for. So it went from 50 and 72 to 84 and 100. 12 months later, when we did a follow-up review, all of the uh, structural uh, angles and positions uh, mechanically. <laughs> here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, mighty crows. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Ah. 
Remember how I said hang on to your earwax? She's just taken the cotton bud, so I'm, I will be hanging on to my earwax, not cleaning it out. Um, so 12 months later, she was holding, maintaining brilliantly. Now, look, I can certainly acknowledge this is a single case study, but I've got to tell you, it happens consistently uh, in our clinics, uh, and certainly in those clinics around the world use, who use manual therapies for uh, soft tissue and soft tissue release techniques for treating bunions. Uh, now, uh, Dan in Sydney that I mentioned, um, he has uh, case study after case study in this book. And you'll see here x-ray after x-ray after x-ray of just like dozens and dozens of cases. Uh, and I know there are plenty of other practitioners getting similar results too. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the day when this treatment method becomes mainstream and reduces unnecessary and risky surgeries from taking place. In fact, today's freebie uh, is the literally the case study article. It lists out the specific manual therapy techniques that we used and also the exercise protocol that we used. So, but here's the question. What if your patient comes to you and they've already had surgery? What then can you do for them? Well, that's what Dean's patient presented with. Now, uh, let me just give you a little bit of uh, background uh, on Dean uh, because he's a physio. You're probably wondering, why is a physio got landed with a post-surgical foot case? I was wondering that when uh, Dean contacted me. So I asked him, Dean, why are you a physio working with post-surgical feet? And well, uh, so if I go through some of Dean's background, he's uh, been in private practice uh, for nearly 20 years. He's got two physios uh, under his employ as well, Mark and Philippa. Mark and Philippa, welcome. And I hope you're all watching here as well. Uh, Dean had told me, and I'm thinking, a physio, they can work on the whole body. Why have an interest in feet? Well, Dean did a uh, Vasily um, course some 10 years ago that got him all fired up about feet. Uh, Dean then uh, viewed a series of videos that I did on the cuboid, uh, and that aligned with some of the stuff that he was doing for obscure ankle injuries, as Dean mentions it. So, uh, Dean, I'm really glad that I was able to contribute to your interest in the most important part of the body. <laughs> so, pardon me. Uh, Dean he sent me some of the patient's uh, relevant history. Um, by the way, let's uh, give this patient uh, an alias and call her Rosemary. Um, all of uh, the uh, detail and data that um, Dean had sent through have been de-identified, so we're maintaining in... Oh, geez, <laughs> her name's not Rosemary. We haven't uh, talked or conferred on this. Um, so, Rosemary. Rosemary's primary concern is walking. Uh, and it feels like that she's overloading the lateral aspect of her foot through mid stats. Uh, Rosemary also has soreness in her fibularis longus. Uh, that's also the, known as the perineus longus muscle. And this uh, soreness comes on particularly with prolonged walking. Now, the surgeon recommended that she see a physio for post-surgical management now that they had fixed the issue. Literally, they had fixated the first MP joint using screws and a plate, and a little more recently, fused the talonavicular joint with screws and a plate. Uh, so the radiology report identifies a mild degeneration in the ankle, subtalar, and the new navicular cuneiform joint. And this is all on Rosemary's right foot. Now, the uh, images also show signs of... Oh, so, yeah. So what I was concerned when I looked at the images, that uh, it looked like there was osteopenia in the foot, like the density of the bones um, wasn't so great. Now, there's no mention of this in the report, so maybe it's just the, um, the quality of image that I was looking at, but it wouldn't surprise me if uh, Rosemary had had limited weight bearing on the foot over, an, she had had over an extended period of time. So uh, the forces of gravity may have reduced the um, osteoblast activity within the bones. Now, um, okay, so Dean uh, mentioned he de-identified the patient, so uh, I'm not sure if factors like age, but I'm guessing probably late 50s, early 60s, just from what I'm seeing uh, from the details that uh, he's provided. So, what can we do now for Rosemary? What can we do? We can go fly. <laughs> um, 
If you've got any ideas, type them in. <gasps> Marami, bonjour, all the way from Canada in Montreal, Quebec. Um, good to have you joining us here. What would be your recommendations or um, treatment options if you had a patient come with you experiencing foot pain and has fused first and first MP joint and the talonavicular joint? Oh, I got a bit of penny, uh, a bit more than I could swallow, I'm afraid. Okay, so uh, Dean's message also included. Uh, uh, so sorry, and just go back one step. So Dean has opted for using a rocker bottom uh, sole in the shoe, some orthotic control, and the goal being to reduce the pressure uh, and support the midfoot, and so we can redistribute the force away from the, the lateral part of the foot. Um, okay, if you've got any other suggestions, please type them in. Oh shit! <laughs> and hopefully things <laughs> um, by the end of the show just fall into place for you. <laughs> Children and animals, tough to work with. I'm not sure who's the child, me or Penny, but there we go. Okay, so here's the line that's crucial. Ted, is there any chance that you might be able to guide me to some resources or reading suggestions that could help me to convince the patient of the best way forward? That line got me excited. Yes, Dean, I do have some suggestions for you. Absolutely without question. But how to convince the patient of the best way forward? Whoa. Convincing patients, um, communication, educating patients. This is the topic that we're going to be focusing on next week because no matter what surgical uh, or non-surgical or magical cure, treatment options or tools or healing powers you might have, if the patient doesn't comply, if they don't agree or they don't follow your recommendations, like it's all for naught, isn't it? So I loved that Dean asked me this most excellent question. Stay tuned for the patient management bizzo that's coming up next week. <laughs> Someone who's very excited about what's coming up next week and can't wait. She's going to be doing that today. So, any suggestions? Let's see uh, what we've got. Uh, uh, review the x-rays. Yes, uh, we've, we've certainly uh, looked at those. Um, rocker bottom soles. Okay, so basically we're looking at trying to contain and not uh, overload or stress any of the surrounding joints. I mean, these joints have been fused. The mo that motion, those forces, those uh, moments of uh, physical force have to go somewhere. And it's probably likely they're going to overload other joints. So I agree with the rocker bottom sole and uh, the foot support approach. But given the surgical fusions and the attempts to reduce the loads with uh, footwear and orthoses, what's this going to do to the muscles and the tissues? Well, typically, if they don't have to work, you're going to get a level of atrophy taking place, which won't serve this patient in the medium to long term. So I have two key recommendations for you, Dean, and everyone else who is working on post-surgical post cases. Those two recommendations are, one, surgical scar mobilization treatment, and two, Kinetic chain assessment for fascial densities. So, surgical scar and the kinetic chain. They're going to be the key things. Now, let's go into the surgical scar mobilization first of all. I'm going to be the first one to acknowledge that there isn't any evidence that I'm aware of that actually improves the specific scar tissues through soft tissue mobilization. However, there is great evidence that when you work on the adjacent and related tissues which compensate for those scars, that can be highly beneficial and highly helpful. Now, Dean's patient, he's got a fused first MP joint and the talonavicular joint. So what I recommend you do is grab, get yourself equipped with a tool 
and identify the fascial densities that have formed in the adjacent tissues. Now, uh, what this means is you've got to go proximal to the surgical site. So with the first MP joint, we've got proximal, which is going to be the uh, cuneiform and here, cuneiform and first metatarsal base. That's definitely going to be a joint there. And then the kinetic chain muscles. So uh, these are exactly as we went through in last week's show. So if you missed last week's show, this is a great show to catch up on because I go into this in detail. Today I'll just highlight proximally the muscles in the kinetic chain that I would be focusing and targeting with the first MP joint fusion are the tibialis anterior, tibialis posterior, <laughs> and extending up to the extensor digitorum longus and even into the quadriceps. Now another key muscle group that you need to focus on are the antagonists. So these are going to be the antagonists uh, muscles to those muscles I just mentioned, which will be the perineal muscles, the calf muscles, and even extending proximally to the hamstrings. This will also, in, uh, now Dean specifically, I'm referring to your case here, it's going to be long-term management because you can use the tool, identify the fascial densities, and then uh, treat them and release them, but you're going to be having looking at long-term management because this patient is now going to have lifelong gait compensations due to the fusions, and we can't do anything about those fusions. That's done and fixed. So if there's going to be lifelong uh, gait adaptations, there's going to be lifelong compensations that's going to form or contribute to the formation of fascial densities in those muscles that I've just outlined them. The key is to find those densities and treat them and release them and you will need to maintain that treatment. Now, what does that mean long term? Long term means basically as long as they're going to keep walking. However, how often will you be needing to see them? It will vary on a case-by-case -case basis. It might be as frequently as um, on monthly. It may be two monthly or even three monthly. But you're going to have to keep an eye on those. This is not a person that you're going to say, like the surgeon, well, I fixed it, now I'll handball you off to someone else. No, if you're going to provide a conscientious, detailed musculoskeletal service, it's going to be on an ongoing basis. It almost, you know, might want to use the analogy, and I would use this with patients, say, a bit like a dental checkup. We're going to have to have a checkup periodically. But given the nature of the tissues and the compensation going on, it's highly likely, you know, but somewhere I would imagine between one and three months, you're going to see that patient on a regular, ongoing maintenance basis. Now... As we discussed in the previous uh, Triple T shows, this treatment approach can sound a bit counterintuitive. Now, as health practitioners, we're often wired to treat the site of pain and not to particularly widen our approach and look at the bigger picture. You know, the adjoining muscles, the tissues, the ligaments, that can be further, uh, much more uh, proximally or distally related to the specific uh, kinetic chain site. So, that's, we've covered that in detail in our previous shows. This broader approach can change your treatment outcomes dramatically. For the patient, it can make a world of difference by releasing those areas that's not even related to the specific site of um, surgical intervention. Now, if you've just joined us, <laughs> well, we've covered a heaps. Uh, we've covered heaps. Penny has now just settled herself right down on uh, to one of my uh, folders and notes and uh, is uh, gently tearing apart uh, the tissues. And uh, we've been, oh, no, now she's gotten up. So there we go, Penny. She's going to see if there's someone else that we can uh, tackle. And ready? Fly, little girl, fly. <laughs> and there's poor old Scully, who's uh, doing it a bit tough now, uh, lying down. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to have such uh, wonderful contributors to our uh, uh, education home office. Okay, so let me uh, just recap. If you've just joined us, uh, we've covered a heaps in today's uh, TED's Tips on Tuesday. Triggered off by Dean Newman, physio in Perth, Western Australia, uh, where his physios, Mark and Philippa, have an interesting post-surgical case where the first MP joint and the talonavicular joints have been fused. So what can you do once the joint's been surgically fused? 
Well, we've discussed the uh, typical first MP joint uh, cases that do present uh, into our clinic pre-surgery. Uh, we've looked at a case study where the treating bunions without surgery and how effective that can be. Uh, we've looked at the interventions for treating bunions without surgery involving taller assisted massage or even a spoon or a knife or a scalpel handle. Uh, we've looked at a current case where surgical fusion of the first MP joint and tail navicular joint and the two key recommendations for treatment for those post-surgical post cases. Uh, we've also had a preview on how to manage the toughest ingredient of your clinics, your patients. Oh, phew, what a show. Jam-packed with practical good stuff, I hope. Um, all of the key pieces are available for you in this uh, free download, the case study freebie that we've got here. Just hit the link on this post that'll be happening at the end of the show and download it. Any questions, type them in. Um, while you're doing that, let me just refresh. Okay. All right. How can I treat... Uh, right, so how can I treat bunions conservatively? Great. All right. I certainly get a lot of requests about this all around the world. Um, we've had a... Uh, we've got a great world first huge announcement that we're making next week on this show that'll make treating bunions conservatively a whole lot easier. So please stay tuned, lock it into your diary for next week. Uh, in, in next week's show, we'll be progressing to part two of Dean's request, which is how do I convince my patients the best way forward? Next week's, oh, excuse me, next week's show is going to reveal some amazing gold that can transform your client management procedures dramatically. If you've ever thought, and, and the thought goes like this, being a health practitioner would be great if it just wasn't for those bloody patients. If you've ever had that thought, next week's show is specifically for you. It's going to be great because we'll have heaps of practical tips that you can literally use in your clinic straight away. Uh, I can't wait to chew the fat on this awesome topic. Thanks again, Dean, for your request and contributions on how to treat feet after surgery. If you've got a bunion case that you'd like me to discuss on the show, please message me on Facebook or send me an email at ted at footmobilization.com. I'd love to hear from you. You won't want to miss next week's Triple T TV show, which will include tips from Ted and Penny that we've gained from 33 years of dealing with patients. Pardon my French, madame, maybe I didn't pronounce it quite so well. Um, thanks very much for joining me today. Let me know what you think of today's show. Uh, if there, It's been a huge episode, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Have you found it useful? If you've got a question or you've got comments about uh, bunions, please write them in down below in the comments box. Uh, if you haven't already liked this page, Facebook, uh, this Facebook page, sorry, uh, Foot Mobilization Techniques, then please do so. Also, if you know a colleague who'd also like to get better clinical outcomes for bunions, then please share this post with them. Make sure you join me for next Tuesday's Triple T TV show where we explore how to manage patients and meet their expectations, particularly when they want to be fixed yesterday. Uh, big thanks to my partner in crime, Dr. Lil. Thank you for crafting, shaping, and putting together all of the content of today's show. Really looking forward to um, showing you my tips again next week. It's been a blast. I hope you've had a cracking good time. And remember, you're just one step away from busting bunions. So get your free download today. And I'm sure there's someone who's going to want to say an extra special word. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go, girl. <laughs> Till next week. Cheers.